When I was growing up, I dreamed of having a, a big, strong oak tree to climb. I, I wanted a tree house. I wanted a, an escape, you know, a refuge from the world. <laughs> but as many of you knew, no, I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles, and the yards are small there. I mean, the trees there are not much bigger than shrubs. I mean, I, I probably could have gotten a hold of an acorn and planted it in the backyard, and it would have taken decades to grow. Uh, in those cramped conditions, it probably would have torn apart the house. Um, so I didn't really have a choice. I had to settle for like this hollowed out spot between some bushes and the fence. That was about as good as it got for me. But uh, I, I talk about that because when the Lord calls Moses to build the tabernacle in Exodus 25, the passage we've already looked at, I think it's sort of like he giving him an acorn. It really is a, a seed, it's, it, and it's being planted in harsh, cramped conditions in this fallen world. And the thing you have to understand is it doesn't really look at all like what it's going to eventually become. And yet, in a way, all the DNA is there, exactly what the Lord wants to do. What I've argued is that the ta- we should see the tabernacle as, as a pattern that keeps growing and expanding It's designed to be far more than just kind of a pathetic refuge. It's it'll ultimately, in a sense, tear the world as we know it apart to remake it into something infinitely better. Now we've seen the Lord uh, reveals that the whole purpose for the tabernacle was that He wanted to to dwell among His people. It's all about restoring the relationship that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned, and God sent them out of the Garden of Eden. And so we've looked at the first three components of the tabernacle in Exodus 25. The Lord instructs Moses um, to build these, and, and in a way they each demonstrate the blessings of the, having God present. Uh, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant and how it shows that God has spoken. That's what was inside the ark was the, the tablets for the Ten Commandments. God has spoken and that he would continue to do so uh, as he appeared above the ark. But it also, in that description of chapter 25, it talks about this table that was in the tabernacle, the table of showbread. And the whole idea there was that God wants his people to enjoy fellowship with him. And then there's the golden lampstand that talks about really that uh, that God's people will live in His light forever. But those blessings, they, they just weren't fully experienced. They weren't fully realized in the tabernacle. And even as believers today, in our relationship with the Lord, we don't experience those things to the full. As we walked through those in chapter 25, I pointed out some of the constraints, uh, the limitations, but those sort of weaknesses are all displayed even more clearly as we continue now. This description of the tabernacle that we find in Exodus 26 and 27, we're going to go from verse 1 of 26 all the way down to verse 19 of chapter 27. What I think we find here are five limitations that that must be overcome to fully experience God's presence. Remember, that's what this is all about, is the presence of God. So what do we gain from understanding these limitations? Well, I think if we don't, if we don't understand these, we won't really grasp how the Lord overcomes them in Jesus Christ. Um, and they also, in a sense, understanding these limitations keeps us from turning our faith into something very limited and in a way pathetic and immediate rather than settling for just the way things are these limitations show us that we have to fix our hope on where this whole pattern is leading where it's heading eternity in the presence of god so the first limitation is this it's a limitation of seeing god you know how it is with us we we rely upon our vision a lot there's that expression seeing is believing and in this modern world that's that's kind of the premise of how people view life when you start talking about faith some people 
act like you're, you're just all a fantasy world, right? If uh, people make fun, they deride obedience to God is something that's pointless. It doesn't make any sense in their minds because it's all about what they can see. Well, we go back uh, to the time of Moses, maybe 1,500 years before the time of Christ, 1,400 years or so, and, and the people of Israel had a, had a different problem. Most of the world in those days believed in the existence of spiritual beings. They believed in all sorts of gods. But the thing was, they wanted to interact with their gods in a physical way, physical representations, idols. That's why in the Ten Commandments, God prohibits the use of idols. And so the answer to both problems, ours today with our society, and theirs then is that we just need to see the Lord. That would fix everything. And you may remember in the earlier part of Exodus, the Lord does appear to them in this fiery cloud. But here's the thing about the tabernacle. The tabernacle would limit his visibility. And so the Lord begins to describe uh, this tabernacle to Moses in Exodus 26, verses 1 through 6. And again, this is all going to be repeated later in Exodus 36 when they're actually putting it together and assembling it. We won't take the time to go through it again later, but just so that you know that it's, it's repeated. So the Lord says this to Moses, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine, fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and you shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them the length of each each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain four cubits all the curtains shall be the same size and then it says five curtains shall be coupled to one another and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another and you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set likewise you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain in the second set 50 loops you shall make on the one curtain and 50 loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that's in the second set. The loops shall be opposite one another and you shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtains one to the other with the clasps so that the tabernacle may be a single whole. So lots of details there, right? These curtains, if we can picture it, they're to be around six feet wide and 42 feet long if we translate cubits to, to feet. And again, representations of cherubim. These angelic creatures are to be embroidered upon them in colorful yarn. It must have been spectacular. Now, the thing that we've seen previously, coming from, going all the way back to Genesis 3, 24, it tells the first time the, that cherubim are mentioned in the Bible, they are stationed by God at the entrance to the Garden of Eden to keep Adam and Eve away from the tree of life, from the presence of God. And so here, this, these embroidered designs kind of serve the same purpose. These curtains are all clipped together, like it's talking about, to make an enclosure. Now, linen, I, I would think, would obscure what's inside, but it probably would still allow, allow light to escape. So the Lord adds another layer to this thing. Verses 7 through 11 tell us this. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains you shall make. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. The eleven curtains shall be the same size. He says, you shall couple five curtains by themselves, and six curtains by themselves, and the sixth curtain you shall double over at the front of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that's outermost, in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that's outermost in the second set. And there again, you shall make 50 clasps, this time of bronze, and put the clasps into the loops and couple the tent together that it may be a single whole. So again, very similar description, right? But this time, it's instead of linen, it's goat's hair. So that's going to be a dark uh, covering. It's going to block any light out. And again, we find this description repeated later on in Exodus 36. Um, but this, these next few verses are only here in chapter 26. Verses 12 through 13 tells us that the Lord explains 
And the part that remains in the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains shall hang over the back of the tabernacle, and the extra that remains in the length of the curtains, the cubit on the one side and the cubit on the other, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and that side to cover it. So again, just to get to this idea that this tabernacle, this tent, it's designed to cover, to conceal what was taking place inside. And as if that's not enough, the, the linen, the goat's hair, then there's skins that are added on top, probably to, to make it a little more weatherproof. Uh, verse 14 says, You shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. So again, the whole idea here is that the Lord was going to be present in the tabernacle. But if you're the average person, you wouldn't get to see it. You couldn't look into it. And we'll learn later that even Moses prays to see the Lord's glory. And even then, as, as much as a, a, an incredible experience that Moses has in seeing God's glory, the Lord even tells him then, that he cannot see his face and live. And yet, one day, that will change. Somehow, Job understood God's plan, even though Job lived before Moses, possibly even before Abraham. You're probably familiar with these verses from Job 19, verses 25 to 27. Job said, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last... He will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall what? I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another. This is my heart faints within me. And we find that idea in the New Testament as well, that one day our resurrected Redeemer will transform our bodies so that we can see the Lord. When we go back to Job, Job was in the middle of intense trials. And yet here he talks about that. He finds comfort and hope in that thought. And we should too. One day, we'll see what the tabernacle concealed. That leads to another limitation. Not only a limit of seeing God, but a limit of approaching God. From the world's perspective, you know, if God exists, then uh, the world likes to think that everybody should be able to find God in their own way. Right? Like, like rivers. Uh, we may start and twist, but we all eventually make our way to the one ocean, right? Some sort of union, mysterious union with God. And the world likes to say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you don't judge others and what they think. Um, well, the tabernacle really refutes that false way of thinking. Because there's only one tabernacle. That's it. There's not several. And it's only given to the people of, of Israel at that point in history. And even in its structure it displays this practical limitation in how God is approached. And we find its framework described in Exodus 26, verses 15 through 29, and then again, chapter 36, 20 through 34. So here in chapter 26, verses 15 through 17, it starts off and it tells us this. The Lord says, you shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits shall be the length of a frame, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together. So you shall do for all the frames of the tabernacle. So these layers of the linen, the goat's hair, the skins, they were all going to be draped over these frames. Each one of them is 15 feet tall, and about 27 inches wide. And the idea is they're built to connect together. They all lock together to form walls. And, and so, verses 18 through 21, the Lord gives Moses the dimensions of the side walls. Here's how he describes it. 
you shall make the frames for the tabernacle. 20 frames for the south side and 40 bases of silver you shall make under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, 20 frames and there 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame and two bases under the next frame. So 20 frames per side. We said they're about 27 inches. So each wall is about 45 feet long and 15 feet high. Right? So it's a good size. It's, it, it, would, it would fit in our sanctuary here. Uh, and so the Lord continues, and he describes a back wall. Right? It's very detailed here. Verses 22 through 25. Oops, we skipped that one. He says, and for the rear of the tabernacle westward, you shall make six frames, and you shall make two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear. They shall be separate beneath, but joined at the top at the first string. Thus shall it be with both of them. They shall form the two corners. And he says, there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases, two bases under one frame, and two bases under another frame. I know you get lost in all these details, right? And it's not even entirely clear exactly how these corners are to be assembled but uh, there's probably some overlap here so they end up with it being about 15 feet wide 15 feet wide 15 feet tall 45 feet long um, and it's all reinforced uh, in addition a few more verses here verses 26 through 29 you shall make bars of acacia wood Five for the frames of the one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the side of the tabernacle at the rear westward. The middle bar halfway up, the frames, shall run from end to end. You shall overlay the frames with gold and shall make their rings of gold for holders for the bars, and you shall overlay the bars with gold. And then verse 30, the Lord reiterates the importance of this. He says... Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. So again, this is supposed to be a portable structure. And yet what we find is it always has this same orientation. Side walls to the north and the south, the back walls to the west, and the entrance is always on the east. Now, I think that's kind of the, the key here. Why does that matter? What's so significant about that? Again, we go back to that same verse in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3.24 says, The Lord sent Adam and Eve east out of the Garden of Eden. That's where the Lord places those cherubim to guard it. And so the idea is here, if people are going to return into the presence of God, they must come from the same direction that they left. Now, what does that have to do with us, right? Well, again, I think it just, we begin to get this idea that there's limitations on how you approach God. For us, it's not a, a physical direction, per se, like it was in, in the construction of the tabernacle. But think about this. John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, much more can be said about why Jesus is the only way, and we'll talk about some of those things even as we continue to look at these limitations of the tabernacle. But for the moment, just notice the, the sense of consistency here. That there have never been multiple ways to God. It's never been just find your own way to him. There has always been, God's always prescribed a single way for people to come. And today, for us, what we see in John 14 in this passage is that for us, it's coming through faith in Christ. He's the one and only way. So the tabernacle shows that limit of keeping people from seeing God, the limit in how they approach God. They have to come from the east. And then third, a limitation of closeness to God or access to him. If you attend a concert or some theatrical performance, there are divisions in the room. I mean, you may not 
they're not visible, but they're still there. The best seats go to those who pay the most money, right? If the average person gets the nosebleed seats, and some people can't even afford to get in the door, that's how it works. And in the tabernacle, we see that sort of, there is a limit to closeness to God. But the determining factor with tabernacle is not money, it's holiness. And so the Lord introduces some divisions here to Moses in Exodus 26, 31 through 34. Again, the first two verses here are repeated later in chapter 36, but verses 33 and 34 are unique. So verse 31, it says, the Lord says, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it, and you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. Then he says, you shall hang the veil from the clasps and catch this. And bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Again, what we saw last time in chapter 25 was that the Lord was going to be present above the ark, above that mercy seat, to speak. But that would would only happen inside all those layers, inside that structure, and behind this veil in this most holy place. And here again, what what do we find on this veil? We find the cherubim again, that, that mark of separation. Later in the book of Leviticus, we find that entrance to that part of the tabernacle is only allowed for the high priest. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement. So the other objects from chapter 25, the table, the lampstand, they're kept outside the veil. And the Lord explains that here in verses 35 through 37. He says, You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table. You shall put the table on the north side. But then this. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen embroidered with needlework. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and you shall cast five bases of bronze for them. So the table uh, of God's fellowship, this lampstand with his light, they're concealed too. Right behind an outer screen, an outer veil. And so here again, the average person won't get to see any of this, won't have access to it. Only the priests enter into that holy place. And we'll learn more in a moment that there's more outside of that curtain. But you begin to get the sense here that there's declining levels of holiness going out from the ark. I mean, it's even reflected in the materials that are used from gold to silver to bronze. So it all raises the question, does the average person ever have any hope of drawing near to God? Well, not in the tabernacle, not in the temple that's built later on. But the Gospels tell us that when Jesus died on the cross, that the curtain of the temple the the later version of this veil, was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, it's not clear whether it's the the inner veil or the outer veil, but Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, explains the implications of this miraculous sign. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Jesus overcame those barriers of holiness so that you and I can draw near to God. Everyone who believes in him, we're cleansed by his blood. He makes us holy so that we, at least in a spiritual sense, can draw near to the Lord, that we can seek him, that we can pray, that he hears us. And when we reach glory, then that sanctification process in our lives will be complete so that all barriers between us and the Lord will be removed. So we see that limit here in the tabernacle, the limit because of our lack of holiness. The fourth limitation has to do with pleasing God. What comes to mind when you smell meat roasting over a fire on a grill. I mean, maybe it just makes you hungry, but uh, it can be more than that too, right? It, it may trigger memories of gatherings with family and friends. It's, I think for most of us, a pleasant smell. And that whole idea, that smell, carries an even greater significance when we turn to the Old Testament because it ties into... God himself being pleased. Now, he doesn't become hungry like us, but the Lord does, uh, he is provoked to anger over sin. And so one of the limitations of the tabernacle is that it never fully pleases God. Sacrifices have to keep being offered to him continually. And so the next component of the tabernacle that we come to is an altar. Now, now the first mention of of an altar in the Bible, to back up for a minute, is is all the way back in Genesis chapter 8. Noah built an altar after the Lord rescued him and his family from the flood, and it tells us that he took some of every clean animal and offered burnt offerings. Genesis 8, 21 tells us, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I've done. So somehow, along with the flood, these sacrifices played a part in somehow satisfying God's wrath, at least partially over the evil present in the world. And so as God saves the people of Israel from Egypt and he takes them and gives them his commandments, his law, he knows that they're not going to keep it. He knows that they're going to violate it. And so he gives them an altar to offer up sacrifices. The Lord begins to describe it in Exodus 27, verses 1 and 2. He says, You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad, The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. And you shall make horns for it on its corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. So this is is kind of big. It's seven and a half feet. Uh, It's it's a wooden square, right? And it stands four and a half feet tall. And it has some sort of horns on the corner. It's all covered in bronze. And the Lord continues to describe it. Verses 3 through 5, he says, You shall make pots for it to receive ashes and shovels and basins and forks and fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall also make for it a grating, a network of bronze. And on the net, you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners, and you shall set it under the ledge of the altar so that the net extends halfway down the altar. Now, it's hard to sort out exactly what that must have looked like, but to me, it just sounds really close to a barbecue grill. You know, it's, it's a great, and it's set within this thing to hold up, you know, they would start the fire, and they burn the sacrifice on it, and yet it's, it's, it's to be transported, it's to be treated in the same respectful way as the ark, and as the table, verses 6 through 8 say, the Lord says, you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze, and the poles shall be put through the rings so that the poles are in the two sides of the altar when it's carried. He says, you shall make it hollow with boards, and it has been sh- as it has been shown you on the mountain, so it shall be made. So 
Again, we find all of that repeated later on in Exodus 38. The workmen follow these instructions. Uh, but here the end of that is, is unique. Again, the Lord is emphasizing that Moses was supposed to copy uh, what he was seeing on the mountain. And yet here's the thing. Animal sacrifices never truly please the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14 tell us this. So this is in the New Testament looking back on all of this. And it says, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And we'll talk more about priests next time in Exodus chapter 28. But for now, the main point here is this, that Jesus offered his life as the perfect sacrifice through his death on the cross, he accomplished what the altar of the tabernacle never could. Because he satisfied the wrath of God against our sins. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons that we say he is the only way to the Father. Because he's the only one who paid that price for us who could. Nothing else can save us from God's wrath. So that's why we trust in Christ alone to save us. And one more, one more limitation this morning before we go. The fifth limitation has to do with the availability of God. When I was growing up in California, the freeways lined with call boxes. I don't know if they had that here in Michigan, but in California, if you broke down somewhere on the road or had an accident, you were never more than a half a mile or a mile or so from one of these telephones. Of course, we don't need those as much today with everybody having mobile phones. Help is more readily available. But think about this. With the Lord, he's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's even more available than some uh, operator at a call box, right? And yet, that reality that's so familiar to us is not what we see in the tabernacle. I mean, we've already considered these barriers the layers, the frame, the walls. But the Lord adds another separation, another division, a fenced court around the tabernacle. So he describes the side walls. Uh, Exodus 27, verses 9 through 11, he says, You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side, the court shall have hangings of fine twisted, fine twine linen, a hundred cubits long for one side, Twenty pillars and their bases shall be of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And then he says, Likewise, for its length on the north side there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, its pillar twenty, and their bases twenty of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. So these dividers, they run 150 feet uh, long alongside the tabernacle. And the Lord describes the front and back in verses 12 and 13. He says, For the breadth of the court on the west side, there shall be hangings for 50 cubits with 10 pillars and 10 bases. The breadth of the court on the front to the east shall be 50 cubits. So 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, that's the outline of this court. And here again, just like we saw earlier, the entrance is on the east side. And the Lord describes the, the gateway for the entrance in verses 14 through 16. He says, The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and three bases. On the other side, the hangings shall be 15 cubits with their three bases and three, uh, three pillars and three bases. And then he says, For the gate of the court there shall be a screen, 20 cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen embroidered with needlework, it shall have four pillars and with them four bases. And so to get to the end of this, the Lord sums it all up. Verses 17 through 19. 
He says, all the pillars around the court shall be filleted with silver, their hooks shall be of silver, their bases of bronze, the length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the breadth 50, and the height 5 cubits with hangings of fine twined linen, bases of bronze, all the utensils of the tabernacle for every use, and all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. Okay. Those are all the verses we're going to read from Exodus uh, this morning. But you get the idea. There's this fence, right? This, this wall. And it stands seven and a half feet tall, five cubits. So people's view is blocked. And this court, like we said, 100 cubits by 50 cubits, so like 150 feet by 75 feet, it's not that big. It's it's about, it's just a little bit bigger than our church building, right? The tabernacle itself is small enough to fit in this room, in this auditorium. And so, as they, I mean, the, the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, at least by the, the censuses that are taken, they include hundreds of thousands of people. And here they are, they're traveling, they're going to be traveling through the wilderness, they'll set up camp, it'll be all circled around this courtyard in the middle of it. And what does it all say to them about the availability of God? The priests could approach him. But what if, if, if your heart is burdened and you want to make an offering to the Lord? With that many people... I mean, it would probably be a long wait, right? It's just this small thing in the middle of this vast horde of people. I mean, all through the Old Testament, we get this sense that worship is kind of anchored to a location. And it's so limiting. And Jesus has a conversation with a Samaritan woman about it. It's recorded for us in John chapter 4. Um, she's talking about how the Samaritans... Worship on Mount Gerizim and the Jews on the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus says this, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. When Jesus sends the Spirit to indwell believers, and that's one phase in this pattern, the spirit within us, we become, in a sense, tabernacles, temples. When that happens, the Lord is always available to us. And that availability, I think, only increases because when you get to the end of Revelation, you read Revelation 21, John talks about this new Jerusalem. And the description that he gives us sounds massive. It's enormous, and it's all golden, and yet it's crystal clear, right? There's no sight barriers. The idea is all the barriers are taken away. The gates are never closed. Verse 22 of Revelation 21 says, John says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And so all of that, just to say, one day, every limitation that we see portrayed in the tabernacle will be completely stripped away. The hope of the believer is that we'll see the Lord, we'll draw near in Christ, we'll have unhindered access, we'll be fully pleasing to Him because of Christ's sacrifice. He'll be fully available to us. But we're not there yet, right? We're in this in-between point. And so don't be deceived into thinking this is all there is, or living as if this is all there is to life. Because there's so much more that the Lord has prepared for us. This pattern that we see in the tabernacle, it's just the start, right? It's the seed. It's limited. But it's continuing to grow and expand in one day. One day, all those barriers will be stripped away completely. And so it's Jesus. He's the key that unlocks that future. And so if you've never done so, I encourage you to accept him as the way, the truth, 
and the life. I want to learn more about how he ties into this pattern. Hebrews 10 that we read from is a great place to, to read, to learn more. But if you believe in him, if you trust in Christ, then are you taking advantage of the access that we do have to the Lord? Do you treasure that? Do you see the value of it? Are you drawing near to God? I encourage you to make that your focus and to share with people about this great salvation and this hope that we have in Christ. May we keep drawing closer and closer to God.